The sun, our sun, has given us light for millions and millions of years. But it wasn't until the last 200 years that we started to notice that the sun was emitting more than just light and had more effect on Earth than we thought. These effects became more pronounced when we started venturing into space and our civilization became more dependent on electronics. We now know that the sun streams plasma and variety of particles into the solar system. Now collectively known as the solar wind, these particles can dramatically change a planet over time. We want to know how and where these winds are formed. The solar orbiter will give us the vital data we need to pursue the answers to these questions. The solar wind is one of the main drivers of space weather, and space weather affects many things in and around Earth. It's not just electronics, but also the orbits of spacecraft around Earth can be affected. Geomagnetic storms heat up the upper atmosphere, causing it to expand. Depending on the altitude of the spacecraft, the expanded atmosphere could induce more drag than normal, causing its orbit to decay faster. Space weather can also cause disruption of radio wave propagation through the ionosphere. This can result in temporary loss of GPS and long-distance radio signals. The solar wind has many variables that are important to understand when constructing a model of how it interacts with the sun and the rest of the solar system. Some of these variables are temperature, density, velocity, and of course, composition. The Solar Orbiter has 10 scientific instruments on board to measure these variables and other aspects of the Sun, 4 in situ and 6 remote sensing. In this video, we're going to take a detailed look at an instrument called Solar Wind Plasma Analyzer, or SWA for short. This is the instrument responsible for collecting data on the solar wind. The solar wind primarily consists of electrons, protons, and alpha particles. There are also trace amounts of ions of heavier elements, such as carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and many more. Because ions and alpha particles behave differently than electrons, due in part to orders of magnitude difference in mass, SWA is actually composed of three different sensors located at various locations on the spacecraft. In order to keep this video to about 10 minutes and still provide interesting operational detail, I'm only going to talk about the Electron Analyzer System, EAS for short. The other two sensors of the SWA operates in a somewhat similar way, but are designed to respond to protons and heavy ions instead of electrons in the solar wind. So let's dive into the inner workings of the EAS. Before we begin, it's worth noting the position of the EAS relative to other SWA sensors. It's the only SWA sensor that's not facing the sun. It's also further away from the center of the spacecraft than any sensor or instrument. The EAS is attached at the end of a 4.4 meter boom that extends from behind the spacecraft. This location is necessary because of the fundamental difference in behavior of alpha particles and ions versus electrons in the solar wind. Alpha particles and ions tend to come from the general direction of the sun while electrons can arrive from any direction. By moving the EAS away from the body of the spacecraft, less of the sensor's view will be blocked, and by placing it behind the heat sheet, it will be protected from the sun. With the location of the EAS explained, let's look at what it's actually measuring. EAS measures the velocity of electrons in the 3D space surrounding it. From this data, it will derive the density, temperature, average velocity, heat flux, and even the origin of the electron flow. However, because of the rapid changing nature of the solar wind near the sun, the EAS must measure in all directions as quickly as possible. And this is where the top hat electrostatic analyzer comes in. It's the sensor used by the EAS and it has two of them. From this point on, I'll refer to the top hat electrostatic analyzer as ESA. To make it easier for you to grasp the complexity of this sensor, I will start with a simplified version of it and build my way up to what's actually used on the Solar Orbiter. So let's get started. 
We start with two concentric metal hemispheres, each having a slightly different radius. The outer hemisphere has a hole on the top. At the bottom, we place a ring of electron detectors. These detectors are microchannel plate detectors. They basically multiply the amount of incoming electrons, making them easier to detect and measure. The outer hemisphere is electrically grounded, while the inner hemisphere has a variable voltage source attached to it. If an electron hits the sensor at certain angles, it will pass through the hole of the outer hemisphere and either hit the inner hemisphere or hit the inner side of the outer hemisphere. Either way, it will never hit any of the detectors at the bottom. When we apply a positive voltage to the inner hemisphere, electrons will be attracted to it. This will cause their trajectory to curve. If an electron is moving slow enough or has low energy, it will collide with the inner hemisphere. If it's moving fast or has high energy, it won't curve as much and will eventually hit the inner side of the outer hemisphere. However, electrons with just the right amount of energy will have a trajectory that match the curve of the space between the two hemispheres. This will allow the electron to move all the way down and hit the detector. Though not complete at this point, our device allows us to select for electrons of a specific energy level based on the input voltage on the inner hemisphere. This is a good start. It's a really good start. Depending on the direction the device is facing, it's able to detect electrons coming from a certain angle rotated around its center line. We're also able to select the energy level we want to measure. If we change this voltage quickly over time, we can measure the amount of electrons and their respective speed in the vicinity of our sensor. And this is done almost simultaneously. There's one catch, however. We can only measure electrons that hit our sensor from a narrow range of angles. One way to increase our range of angles is to rotate the spacecraft itself. This is the path that was taken by the Messenger spacecraft when it used its neutron spectrometer in orbit around Mercury. However, this is not an option for the solar orbiter because its heat shield must face the sun at all times. So we're not doing that. Instead, we will add a metal deflector cup with a big hole in the middle on top of our current device and separate the two by a small distance. We will also attach a voltage source to this deflector. As electrons pass near the deflector, their trajectory will be curved. The curvature depends on the energy of the electron and the voltage on the deflector. But, in order for the deflected electron of a particular energy level to successfully pass between the space of the deflector and the outer hemisphere, it has to approach the deflector from a certain angle. And this angle depends on the voltage that is applied to the deflector. Once the electron gets to the hole in the outer hemisphere, it will be selected for based on its energy level. As you may have noticed, the voltage on the deflector that allows electrons to curve into the outer hemisphere depends not only on the angle of approach, but also on the energy of the electron. In addition, the deflector changes the energy of the electron. Since we know how the voltage on the deflector affects incoming electrons, we can compute the selected angle and actual energy level of the electron based on the voltage applied to the inner hemisphere and the deflector. By changing the voltage on the deflector, we can select for any angle plus or minus 45 degrees from the line that separates the deflector from the outer hemisphere. Sweep that around the center line of the device and we have a coverage in the shape of a torus. If we combine two of these devices set at 90 degrees from each other, we end up with two tori coverages that covers the entire sky. That's why the Solar Orbiter has two ESA sensors. Now we can detect and measure the energies of electrons coming from any direction. The entire sky is covered without having to rotate our spacecraft. We can measure in all directions almost simultaneously. There's one critical shortcoming of our current device at this point. It cannot deal with the dynamic range of the data we're trying to collect. Our detectors produce signals each time they are hit by electrons. After this interaction, it takes time for the detectors to recharge. 
Too many hits in a small amount of time and the detectors become saturated. That is, for an increase in incoming electrons, the output signal no longer increases. This makes the device useless above this point. The way to fix this issue is to limit the amount of electrons that hit the detector. This can be done by physically making the detector smaller. The problem with this approach is that the detector becomes less sensitive when the amount of electrons hitting the detector becomes low. A better solution is to electrically control the amount of electrons that hit the detector from a given angle and energy level. By adding another deflector above the hole of the outer hemisphere and applying a voltage to it, we can physically adjust the region where the voltage applied to the inner hemisphere is effectively able to bend the incoming electron stream. This has the effect of limiting the amount of electrons that can be bent by the inner hemisphere, thus limiting the electron flow to the detector and avoiding saturating them. Now we have the complete workings of how the electron analyzer system detects electrons and their energies from all angles almost simultaneously. With this data, along with the data collected by the other two SWA sensors, a detailed picture will emerge that will help explain the interaction between the solar wind, the sun, and the rest of the solar system. This understanding is vital to Earth and for the colonization of the solar system. I'm DexDFX, Assessing the Universe.